The convening of the National Assembly is slated for the highly anticipated convening of the National Assembly is slated for Monday, November 10, 2014. Among the issues hovering over the agenda of the National Assembly is an anticipated no confidence motion uh, to be brought by the joint opposition parties. With me to discuss this issue and potential options on the part of the government of Guyana is first uh, Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Anil Nandlal, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Honorable Caroline Rodrigues Burkett, and also Member of Parliament and Community Development Officer in the Office of the President, Reverend Kwame Gilbert. Lady, gentlemen, welcome to this special program. Thank you. Thank you. If I could first ask uh, the AG, it is known the various discussions uh, regarding a potential no confidence motion in the National Assembly by uh, the a Partnership for National Unity and the Alliance for Change. Uh, but before we discuss uh, and perhaps anticipate some of the events of Monday's uh, convening of the National Assembly, let's take a step backward and deal with perhaps the genesis of this parliamentary uh, crisis, if, I, if you will. Thank you very much, Gordon, and um, good day to your viewers. Um, a, a perhaps a convenient point is to recognize, firstly, that the government since the 2011 elections recognized the need to work and to dialogue with the opposition in order to move our parliamentary agenda forward since they enjoy a majority in the National Assembly. And government at the highest level has been working assiduously with at least the major opposition party constantly with a view of reconciling differences and with the ultimate objective of advancing the development agenda of our country. That's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make that the threat of a no confidence motion has been hovering, as the word you use, over our country for a while. I believe it first emanated from the Alliance for Change. Now, I want to say that that is a constitutionally recognized procedure. In fact, the Constitution says that if a confidence motion is brought against the government and it is successful, then the government must resign and Parliament must be dissolved and we must go to an elections within three months of the passage of that confidence motion. So the opposition, one would argue, has a right to assert this power which the Constitution has given them. We live in a constitutional democracy and therefore we must embrace all the options which the Constitution presents. The various official holders or office holders in the Constitution. To fast track a little, the President having regard to the public uh, sentiments expressed by both opposition parties that they are going to proceed along the path of passing this confidence motion in the National Assembly, the President responded by issuing a, an address to the nation last Tuesday. And specifically in relation to the no confidence motion, he said that firstly he agreed for local government elections to be held next year and he identified a time frame within that event is likely to take place. Uh, I suppose uh, one could not have and one cannot at this point in time definitively identify a date for the local government election simply because we have to consult with GCOM and get from them their state of readiness to hold a, a local government election that will be different from anyone that we have ever had in this country because we have amended the Constitution and we have passed new laws that will allow a local government elections to be held under a different system altogether from that which we ever had in this country. So um, the government spoke, the president rather, spoke from that perspective. But nevertheless, emphatically, he made the assertion that we are going to have local government elections next year. That being said, he said that if the no confidence motion 
is proceeded with by the opposition, then there are options that are available to the government as well. And he identified two options, I believe, the dissolution of the parliament and or, or prorogation of the parliament. Now, the dissolution and prorogation of the parliament are two constitutionally permitted mechanisms. I want to make that very clear. The, just like how the constitution allows for a government to be removed by a confidence motion, the constitution also allows that that confidence motion can be aborted or the, con the confidence motion or parliament can be dissolved or parliament can be prorogued. Now granted the government has not yet indicated what option it will um, exercise, it is important that we recognize that these are two legal and constitutional options. They are deeply rooted in the Constitution, and the, the issue of prorogation and dissolution are concepts that have been in the English constitutional system since the days of the Magna Carta 800 years ago. And all the territories that were once colonies of England, when they became independent, England handed to them a constitution that contained those two mechanisms. And these are two mechanisms that have been used widely across the Caribbean and the entire Commonwealth. Prorogation and disillusion of Parliament. I say that simply because I have seen statements emanating, unfortunately, from both opposition parties to suggest that there is something wrong with disillusion or prorogation of the parliament, prorogation in particular. Wrong as in cowardly, as quoted in today's or one of the dailies today. One says cowardly, one says that um, it is uh, some form of dictatorship. Nothing that is rooted in the constitution can be wrong, can be unlawful, or can be construed to be a dictatorship. It is a constitutionally recommended and provided procedure. And if the president chooses to exercise it, then he's exercising a democratic power, a constitutional power. I view this as an opportunity, assuming, for example, the president prorogues, I see this as an opportunity for both parties to draw back and decide or work out a modality of the way forward. I don't see this as a bad thing. First of all, it's as a legal and a constitutional mechanism, but in terms of the, the, the uh, developmental agenda of our country, I see this as a mechanism that the political parties can come to the table to work out what is in the best interest of our country. Is elections at this stage the best interest of our country? We have on the parliamentary agenda the anti-money laundering bill. Now, I have not yet um, been able to speak on what happened in Paris where we got a one-year reprieve. We didn't get a one-year reprieve unconditionally. There are conditions and as a country we have to work together in terms of satisfying those conditions because the consequences if we don't satisfy them within the time we have now been given, the final time we have now been given, the consequences are going to be catastrophic. If, if I might ask uh, Minister Rodriguez Borgen, uh, perhaps to, of course, in the interest of the business of the National Assembly, uh, acting in the interest of the people of the Republic of Guyana, could you chronicle the life of the 10th Parliament with specific reference to, to that uh, point of view? Thank you, Gordon, uh, Michael Gordon. I don't think that the population is unaware of the troubles we have had in this Parliament. And if you look at what has been the trend, it's opposition to some of the major pieces of legislation that would take this country forward. When we think about Amila and where that project could have been by now in terms of the construction and how that would have transformed Guyana, that's the first one that comes to mind. And it has spoken about the anti-money laundering bill. This is not just about what the impacts on, the, on our population here, but how we interact with other countries. So for example, some people would have noticed 
that when they could have used their credit cards in the past to do certain transactions, they cannot do that now because of our situation and in, 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 the, in the international community. We have an anti-money laundering bill that is outstanding. But we also have the education bill that's on the order paper that is very, very important for our country. And so what has happened in the, in the last few years, basically, we have marked time on Guyana's development. These are major pieces of legislation, and we would like to see this, this happen. Let me ask so, a very important question. Why? Well, because the opposition, why, why is it? Why have we marked time on Guyana? Because we have not been able to, to pass the, the, the legislation relating to the Amila project. We have not been able to pass the legislation on the anti-money laundering bill. We have not been able to do that. Those are two major pieces of legislation. We have also placed ourselves in a very uh, unenviable position, for example, with not passing the environmental tax uh, legislation. You know that was voted down as well. And Guyana is coming up, for example, um, at the WTO for its trade policy review. And that was raised at the last, last trade policy review. It will be raised again. So the opposition has single-handedly really put us in a very negative image as far as it relates to our international commitments on that aspect of trade, but also on anti-money laundering. And so this is why I say we have uh, marked time on certain, on certain things. Of course, the government has, uh, as far as, as possible, moved forward with other developmental projects. And Michael, if we look at the, the genesis of this no confidence motion, why is this no confidence motion brought? And the explanation that I have seen thus far from the Alliance for Change is that the Minister of Finance has illegally restored budget cuts. When we know that the first time they, they had budget cuts and we went to, uh, to court and we had a favorable ruling, so using that precedent, we know that we have not, nothing wrong. The budget cuts, what were the, the cuts in the budget? It was about the Amerindian Development Fund. It was about hinterland airstrips. It was about very, very important projects for the development of our Amerindian communities and the country as a whole. And so this is why I said we have, uh, the, the opposition has made Guyana mark time um, to a large extent. Reverend Gilbert, if I were to ask you uh, at the beginning of the 10th Parliament, is there anything you would have done different as a member of Parliament or perhaps in support of your colleagues on the government side of the, of the National Assembly? Well, uh, thank you, Michael. I, if, well, I, I think I would want to stay away from um, identifying what I individually would have done because, as you are aware, um, anything that can be done has to be done to a collective. Um, but I want to Id point out that when I entered the 10th Parliament, having had some experience in the 9th Parliament um, under a different arrangement, it became very clear to me um, in the 10th Parliament that because we were faced with a situation that previously not existed, that in order to succeed in the 10th Parliament, in order for the country to benefit in the 10th Parliament, um, the modus operandi would have to be different. We would have to approach things differently. In essence, we needed to have um, consensus building, we needed to have compromise. And so at the beginning, if we are to chronicle from then to where we are now, at the beginning I saw government making efforts to create an environment for the kind of dialoguing. And um, we came into our first debate, uh, budget debate um, in the 10th parliament. And that is when I, be I think we began to see the emergence of a reality that from a personal perspective, I became very aware that it was not going to result in the best interests of our country. There was too much acrimony, and a lot of this, this, this stance that was taken, the position that was taken by the opposition, and a lot of it, one could not identify the justifiable reasons behind the positions they took. And Minister Rajiv pointed out about some of the projects that were stymied, cut, um, that would have been for the development of our country. And so the, the fact that we could not arrive at consensus on matters that were of national interest, to me, represented a failure of the 10th Parliament to really work in the interest of our country. While unavoidably we have come to a place where we are now contemplating 
if the motion is passed, there on, um, inevitably there is going to be general elections. I am of the view that elections will not necessarily solve the problems that we have currently existing. What will? We have to sit down and, and, and arrive at a position as a government and opposition and decide on what is in the best interest of this country and hold to the agreements that we make. And I think uh, my colleagues who are in the cabinet would be in a better position to articulate the efforts that have been made by government to have a positions arrived at with the opposition. Many of those arrangements did not bear fruit. And so I believe it, our people in this country, while I believe our people will go to elections if it is called, I really believe that our people would much prefer that we work through those issues in the best interest of the country. Because as, the, as uh, Minister Nandlal pointed out, a lot of the issues that are before the parliament, if we are able to find consensus on them and agree on them, as we have been presenting as a government, we are going to be able to move this country forward in the direction. And so um, national uh, general elections may not necessarily solve the problem. Um, if we are forced to go there, we will have to go there. But I believe that our people, by and large, our population wants the parliament to work the way that it can work if we, if we are able to put the interests of the country and the opposition is able to look past the partisan positions they have taken on many of the issues and work in the best interests of our country. KG, Reverend Gilbert raised, uh, and he mentioned a very powerful word, acrimony. And the 10th parliament, uh, observers would say, would be or could be char characterized by, uh, s by significant conflict and friction among the three branches of government. Uh, well, I have, spoken, I have spoken in depth and adept about this matter. The 10th Parliament has been characterized by an, a majority in the opposition benches that want to run, want to exercise executive power. So naturally, you will have a collision course, and when they are, when it is pointed out, out to them by the government as well as the court, that you cannot exercise executive power via the parliament, the acrimony increases, and the people of Guyana suffers. Garland spoke about the budget cuts. What precipitated? the no confidence motion. It's because the Minister of Finance, upon the advice of the Attorney General, as a result of a court ruling, and as a result of the decision of cabinet, decided to restore the monies that were cut from the budget. Now, so it is to punish the government for restoring those budget cuts. Who benefited from that restoration? The $10,000 that are being distributed every single day throughout this country to the parents of children to subsidize their education was cut from the budget. That was restored. The, all the Amerindian projects that Karen spoke about, they would not have taken place. Those monies were restored. The student loan for the University of Guyana was cut from the budget. That was restored. The no confidence motion is to punish the government for those restorations. And who are the beneficiaries of those restorations? The people of Guyana. And that is what um, Kwame Gilbert is saying. That ultimately, while we flex political muscles in the National Assembly, we do so to the detriment and at the expense of the ordinary people of this country. We have to pay a judgment of six million US dollars to a Suriname company. Six million US dollars. That's over 1.2 billion dollars. We have to pay that to a Suriname company because we were unable to pass a law in the parliament. Other companies that are similarly circumstanced have already written to me threatening legal course of action because the law is not passed and they feel that they are being discriminated against because we have entered into certain international obligations. That $1.2 billion that we are giving to this Surinamese company who continue to do business here, continue to make money, could have been spent to buy vaccines for our children, could have been spent on the school feeding program, it could have been spent on 
the schooling of our children. Instead, it has to go to a company in Suriname. So those are the issues that we have to find a way of resolving. And rushing into an election because certain people's egos are hurt, I don't believe will benefit this country. Uh, Reverend Gilbert, our time is almost gone. In the next 48 hours or thereabout, from the time of this interview, uh, the, there will be a sitting of the National Assembly. Your closing remarks. Well, I would not want to preempt anything because we are still to hear what, what decision the President will make. My caution will be that whatever decision is made, whatever position is taken by the opposition in the country, whatever decision is made by the President, my hope is that it will work in the best interest of the country and the nation of Guyana, that our people, I, I really believe that our people have gotten to the point where they are fatigued and fatigued in the sense that they, have, they, they want our parliament to work. They have sent all of us to the parliament to work in their best interests, and we have to be able to put aside whatever political issues are there and work in the best interests of our country. And I am hopeful that over the next 48 hours, that the decisions that will emerge will be in the best interests of Guyana. And I am, I am very hopeful and confident that that will be the decision that the president will make, what is in the best interests of the country. Minister Rodrigues Burkett, uh, wearing your hat as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, a significant burden currently rides on the shoulder of Donald Ramatar as he de contemplates the actions of Monday and the decision to made subsequently. Perhaps from the context of Guyana's image outwardly and also in the context of your uh, occupation as a member of the National Assembly and you are at the forefront of what obtains there. Uh, your closing remarks on this um, imminent, perhaps, action? You, you're certainly correct that there's a heavy burden on the shoulders of our president, and I'm confident that the right decision will be made given uh, the, the, the corner that we've been pushed into by the actions of the opposition. But I'm an, an eternal optimist, and 48 hours is also a very long time. Uh, th things uh, may change if I think people put Guyana first. And I'm hoping that with some of the announcements that were made by the President, you will recall and all Guyanese are aware that one of the things that uh, were being called for all the time was local government elections. The President actually gave a time frame for that and he said by the end of the second quarter, which is June next year, just about seven months away. And I think that that, as Anil mentioned, is as clear as the president can be at this point in time. And um, that was something high on the agenda of the opposition, at least as far as they've been saying publicly. And so I'm hoping that there will be some kind of a meeting of minds, some kind of rethinking on where we want to take this country. And we would be able to act in the best interest of our, of, of our people. That said, uh, the president has said what his options are. And I believe that uh, whatever option is exercised by the president, that it must be accepted by all its legal, he will be completely within his legal right to do so. Because the impression that's being created um, using adjectives such as cowardly and those kinds of things, it's as if the president is doing something that he does not have the right to do. But when Whatever option um, is used by His Excellency, um, I would want to encourage as well that uh, that Guyana, I would like to see Guyana, um, the people of Guyana, remain calm in all of this because they're, they're veiled threats as well. I've seen some um, newspaper articles speaking about unpredictable consequences attributed to uh, the, the leader of the opposition, uh, retired Brigadier Granger, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, should, should worry some people, but I'm hoping that we would be able to get through this. I am I'm confident that Guyana will overcome in all of this. Attorney General, you too carry a significant burden because the President's legal counsel depends heavily on your, uh, your, your promises within the legal fraternity. Uh, are you too an incurable optimist as much as Minister Rodriguez Burkett? I'm an optimist as well as a pragmatist. I want to make it very clear that it is the opposition that has 
put us in this dilemma. Not the government, it is the opposition that has brought us here. The APNU asked for local government elections and the president has announced that he will hold elections. Unfortunately, the, and it is the Alliance for Change that has been pushing this confidence motion issue. Unfortunately, though the APNU has been ambiguous because they're playing both sides, they are demanding local government elections as well as saying that they are supporting a no-confidence motion. The president has explained that these are irreconcilable events that are going to take place. You cannot have both. The APNU has been unable, though the president has announced local government election, has been unable to explicate itself from the tentacles of the AFC. So they are caught in that conundrum. But they are responsible for us having this discussion and for me having to advise the president of his constitutional options. They are exploring their constitutional options and of course the constitution provides the president with options as well. And we are exercising those options. That's the first point that I, um, I want to make. The second point I want to make is that the people of Guyana are ultimately the ones who will suffer. I have gone I have been part of this program for the distribution of the We Care Cash Grant. And that program would not have been possible had the budget cuts not been restored. Every single person in this country that received $10,000 for their children, they would not have gotten that money if the monies were not restored to the budget. And when the monies were restored, the government now faces this confidence motion that we keep hearing about. But we have to be prepared. We are the government. And we have to be prepared to take the responsible and constitutional road to carry this country forward. The party, the People's Progressive Party, has played that role historically from the inception all the way from the 50s. And we will continue to take that mature, constitutional, and democratic road. I heard it said that we are avoiding the no-confidence motion because we are afraid to defend our track record. Our track record speaks for itself. Anyone who has left this country 20 years ago and come back now to see where we have taken this country as a government, know, they ought to know, where our track record is. Defending our track record is the least of our concern. And a no-confidence motion is not a mechanism for us to defend that track record. If you look at a no-confidence motion, it's one line. It says the opposition has no confidence in the government. What is there to defend about that? You, you, we will go to a debate. Let us assume that we go to the debate. What will happen in the debate? At the end of it, there will be a numerical equation. There will be a vote. So it's not about debating and considering merits. So those who are advocating that concept that the government does not want to defend its record or is unable to defend its record, it's an uninitiated argument. The no confidence motion is not the mechanism for that. This government is prepared to defend its record proudly We're at every forum. And that is what we will do. If we go to the elections, we are going to do it. If we go to the parliament to, to Monday, we are going to do it. And the people are on our side because they are viewing what has happened. They are viewing how they are benefiting from the government's policy. And they are not unaware of the struggles and challenges that the government has to overcome to deliver to them goods and services. We are in touch with the people and they are seeing these events and their verdict will be decisive whenever that time comes. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Anil Nandlal, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Carlin Rodriguez Borkas, and uh, Community Development Officer in the Office of the President, Reverend Kwame Gilbert. I am most grateful for you affording me this opportunity to hold these discussions with you and looking forward to doing this again. Thank you. I'm your host, Michael Gordon. Thanks for watching. Thank you.